You are listening to Christians in Corporate, the podcast that inspires corporate Christians to bring their full selves to work by shining a light on successful corporate executives and leaders across the globe. I'm your host, Peja Rakintari. Let's get into it. From the projects, to partnership, to the pulpit, this is the story of Sam Mendenhall. Sam is a highly respected and award-winning trial lawyer who currently works at Winston and Strawn, which is a law firm, global law firm, headquartered in Chicago. Sam has been involved in numerous high-profile cases, including the successful prosecution of actor Jesse Smollett. He also won, uh, has won numerous awards, including being selected as an Illinois leading lawyer since 2005. But looking back, you know, into his childhood, you would have never, never, you would never think that his future right now would have been this bright. Because he grew up in the projects of Chicago and then went off to serve in the US Army. And it was there he graduated number one in his class and served with distinction. Sam's story is full of light, it's full of hope, it's full of favor, and it's full of God's grace. I pray it blesses you today. Sam, thank you so much for joining today's podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing well. How are you doing this afternoon, Pedro? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Um, I'm so happy you joined and I'm so excited to get stuck into this conversation because I know it's going to be a great one. Your testimony is absolutely amazing and I can't wait to share it with the listeners. Um, but before we get into the conversation, I do want us to do some quick fire round questions um, just to kind of get allow people to know who you are, um, break the ice a little bit. Um, now these are simple questions. They're this or that questions, meaning all you need to do is just choose an answer, one answer. You don't need to think too deep because it isn't deep. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> and we'll take it from there. Okay. So are you ready? Yeah. All right. So the first one is, would you rather work from home or work from the office? From the office. Yeah, I knew that was going to be your answer. Um, email or live conversation? There's something about person, personal person touch. I'd rather do live than email. Yeah. Predictability or excitement? Predictability. I, I'm very big on predictability. <laughs> Music playlists or podcasts? Music playlists. Mm, who's your favorite artist? Probably right now, Tasha Cobb Leonard. I I have her on my rotation. Oh, your yeah, glory. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, glory. <laughs> and, uh, I love that. And uh, and then I also, I have an eclectic taste and I have some Celine Dion and I have some Jay-Z. Okay. And I have some, so I've, I've got the full range. I, okay. I full range okay, eclectic. eclectic. That sounds good. Um, Fruits or vegetables? Fruit all day. Fruit. What's your favorite fruit? Probably kiwi, then pineapple, and then watermelon. Okay, Once I see your vitamin C up in there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. I'm an old military guy, so I generally up by 5, 6 a.m. every day. So sunrise. Yes, I am sunrise too. Reading or writing? Love to read. I love to read. I try to read a book a month. Wow. Wow. Do you, do you read the physical book or you audio? Physical, physical book. Uh, I, I love the sound of paper turning. Yeah, yeah. I'm old school like that too. I just find it so hard for me to actually sit down and read. So I do a bunch of audio book, audio books. And that's the only way I'm able to get my one book a month in. Um, road trip or plane trip? If it's under four hours, I rather be on the road other than that I'm, I'm flying yeah 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 and then the last one and I kind of cheated here I put three options soccer football or basketball basketball all day ah. I love basketball okay who's your team uh Chicago Bulls but it, they're not that well so Lakers <laughs> uh my son and I went to see the Lakers in the end season <laughs> tournament and uh so basketball yeah. in their former life I used to play some basketball with President Obama at oh. East Bank Club here in Chicago oh so that sounds amazing yeah 
Like, that sounds amazing. Me. That sounds amazing. East Bank Club is the place to be. Um, yeah. All right, we're going to get started because I want yeah. everyone to hear the amazing testimony, um, the amazing work that God has done in your life. And we're going to start from the beginning because I love to kind of see, you know, how you grew up, where you grew up and some of the key things that you learned um, as, as you were growing up. Um, so with that, can you share? Can you share how did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Who did you grow up with? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Sure thing, Peju. I grew up right here in Chicago, lifelong Chicago resident, grew up in two public housing developments. My first couple of years, we were in a public housing development right across from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And then we moved to a public housing development right around uh, 43rd and Cicero on the way to Midway Airport. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with my brothers and sisters and then my mother and father in the household. So it's been to go from public housing to where I am today, I tell everybody it's been a journey of faith. Yeah, yeah. No, that's amazing. And I you know, I know your mother played a huge role in, in the shaping of your life and you know, speaking yes. into your life. Can you share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. My mom named me Samuel after Samuel in the Bible. Uh my mom was very religious and uh she used to be an evangelist and uh so he said, she always told me she gave me back to the Lord at birth. Mm -hmm. And that's why she named me Samuel. I'm the only sibling with that uh, biblical name. And so my mom has always emphasized in our life three things, even in housing, uh, Pedro. I still mm -hmm. remember to this day her walking me to school sometimes. One, just because you're in public housing doesn't mean public housing has to live in you. Mm -hmm. Second point, she said, where you start, Sam, isn't where you have to finish. And then third, and most importantly, with God, all with God in your life, all things are possible. So I even knew then at a young age, my story isn't going to end at housing. Mm -hmm. My story isn't going to end where I'm at now because God is bigger than my circumstances and God is bigger than my surroundings. So I like someone hearing this podcast to know that no matter your situation, no matter what you're at now, with God, all things are possible. No limits, no boundaries with God in your life. Yes. Those are facts and timeless, timeless, timeless information, yeah. right? She said it decades ago and it decades come ago. to us. Yeah. And so that's, that's amazing. And so we in you the midst first... of it too, Pedro, let me just say in the midst of housing, not when I got out of it, in the midst of it, she said, mm -hmm. your story will not end, end here. Yeah. I always took that to heart. And I, yeah. and I always knew the God had something better for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was here to do my part. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Just yeah. needed to do your part. Yeah. But I think just learning that at a young age, right? That was probably the only thing you knew for yourself, right? Yes. Like if your yeah. mom said it, you know, it was a seed that she sowed into your heart. And that's the only thing that you believed. I'm sure if you had, she had said something else, you would have believed that, right? And so that is just such a wonderful lesson, even just for parents listening to this, right? That's sowing the right seeds, saying the right things to your children um really does matter because essentially it grows the child grows into it um exactly. so were you the only I know you said you had siblings were you the first child where were you in the oh no I was I've come from a very large family Pedro I've got five brothers five sisters so I'm oh. the seventh of 11 and the, so seven is the number of completeness but yeah. they still have <laughs> four after me so even though I was seven they have four after me, so I'm the seventh okay. of eleven kids. And wow. uh, and I want to just go back on something you said, Paige, because someone listening to this needs to hear that. Proverbs tell us life and death is in the power of our tongue. Even at a early age, my mom spoke life over us mm -hmm. and our potential. Mm -hmm. As you said, the seed you sow in your kids mm -hmm. will take fruit. And grow either way. If you sow good seeds, there'll be good seeds. If you sow bad seeds, there'll be bad seeds. Yeah. So try to instill positive in your kid's life. Try to instill positivity in your sibling's life. Let them know what they can be, not what they can't be. Let them know that with God, all things are possible. 
that your future is limitless and your future is bright. And so she instilled that, especially in me, giving me the name Samuel. So I've always knew I was destined to do something well. Mm -hmm. I, what it was at the time, I didn't know, but I knew with God in my life, I could do great things. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And one of the things that um, I know she said to you was when they took, I think, prayer out of uh, school, and no. she said something like, um, you know, they can take prayer out of school, but they can't take prayer out of the home or something like oh, that. I probably Absolutely. With my siblings and everything, when they took prayer out of school, my mom still had us pray every day mm -hmm. and uh, my siblings. They, she said, you can take prayer out of school, but you can't take prayer out of my house. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a time going to school where my mom didn't have us all together and pray before mm -hmm. we went to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sure that totally influenced you as you grew up. Right. Because that's all Absolutely. you knew what to do. That's all you knew. Um to do as you grew up. So I, I love that she really grounded those principles um, into you and it's, it's taken fruit um, even as we speak today, decades after. Um, yes, even decades later when I would take my kids to school, uh, elementary school, I would have each of them pray each day and then I would pray with them. So in the car, we would pray and everything. So I instilled that value in them as well. You have to pass it down. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll pass it down to their children when they have them. I'm not in a hurry to be right. a grandfather, but <laughs> whenever they do have them, I hope they instill some of these same timeless mm -hmm. values. Yeah. There's a scripture that says, chain up a child in the way that, in which they should go. And when they're older, they should they will not depart from it. So Absolutely. that's a promise that we can stand on, right? That as long as we sow the right seeds, um, that when they're older, they will not depart from it. Um, okay, I did want to ask you, how did you come to faith? Because obviously you had a mother, a praying mother, a powerful mother, an anointed mother. Um, but how did you actually come to faith? It went. So I've always had faith because one or the other thing, and my mom said in the Mendenhall household, you go to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Church was every Sunday. My dad was a, I learned my work ethic from my dad, a powerful work ethic, but it, my mom was the religious one in the house. So every Sunday we went to church. So I always had faith as a component, but at some point in this well, message for somebody out there, it has to go from being mom religion to your religion. Yep. From being, uh, you have to accept Christ for yourself mm -hmm. and you have to know Christ for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mom, religion is fine. Dad's religion is fine. Grandma's religion is fine. Granddad's religion is fine. But you have to have a personal relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ. And so in, in around, I went to the army on my 18th birthday, and I'll talk to you about that. And, but then I got out of the army around 21. Mm -hmm. And then I was my real, real journey to faith and uh, having some life experiences. And mm -hmm. then I just some things that I knew that I need to have Christ in my life mm -hmm. in order to get, maximize my full potential. Mm -hmm. And let me say this, it's going to sound a little tricky, but it's a word for somebody. Mm -hmm. You can be a good person and not be a good Christian, but you can't be a good Christian Without and not be a good person. person. They'll mm -hmm. go hand in hand. And I was a phenomenal person, paid you. I didn't drink, didn't smoke. I had, I had alcohol. I stopped cursing at age 18, having mm -hmm. cursed since 18, mm -hmm. and I was 60 this year. Mm -hmm. But uh, even then, there was something missing, and that thing mm -hmm. missing was Christ. Yeah. And when I accepted Christ in my life around the age of 21, my life just skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. from that. Yep, yep. That's what he does. Yeah. That's what he yeah. does. Yeah. That's what he does. Okay, so... As you said, you went to the army at 18. So you, obviously you spent 18 years in the projects with your family, yes. um, 11 children, mom and dad. And when you turned 18, you went, you moved to the army. I think it was in Fort Hood and South Korea, correct? Yes. How was that experience for you? And here's the thing, Pedro, that was my life. That was one of my life defining moments. At 18, I had only seen the projects, public mm -hmm. housing. I had never been on a plane before in my life. Mm -hmm. My first time on a plane was on my 18th birthday when I joined the Army. They 
put me on a plane and sent me to basic training. Mm. Prior to that, I had never been on a plane. And I was just, I was looking around in housing and stuff. And somebody said something to me, you can only be as far as you see. Mm-hmm. And I said, I've got to see more then because mm-hmm. I, I know there's more out there for me. Mm-hmm. I would go downtown as uh, African-Americans. We would go down south to see our grandmother and grandfather in a car, but never mm-hmm. on a plane. So mm-hmm. we would do the 20-hour drive to oh. Alabama to see my father's uh, parents and stuff. But in terms of a plane, the first time I've ever was on a plane was my 18th birthday going to the Army. Mm-hmm. And the Army, it taught me three things, discipline. I growing up in housing, there isn't the most disciplined environment. There's a lot of things going on. I avoided all of those. I played football. I was a really good football player, but I wasn't a great football player. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I so the army taught me discipline. Two, it, had, it gave me a chance to see the world, to see things bigger than uh, housing. And to interact with people from all over, different races, mm-hmm. different cultures, mm-hmm. different surroundings. When I was in Korea, I one of my best friends was a Korean soldier, and he took me to his home. We I celebrated Korean New Year with a family, and so I, it was just opened up a world of possibilities. Then I was in, as you mentioned, Fort Hood, Texas, mm-hmm. and that was tremendous as well. So in terms of discipline seeing the world and meeting new people and seeing the different cultures. The army was tremendous. And it allowed me, and I finished first in my class in the army. And so, and then I took a test for sergeant, the promotion of sergeant. And at that time I had scored a record for the highest sergeant oh. score on the whole base. Mm. And but I said, I wanted to get out and go to college because I wanted to go to college So I went to college and law school on a GI Bill. So uh, Mm, so the Army was very formative as well. Uh, Housing was formative. Then the Army was my next really big uh, formative step in my life. And it gave me the springboard and the resources to go to college and law school on a GI Bill. Yeah, I love that. There's there's a couple of things you said, um, and I'll probably rephrase what you said, but ultimately you can't be what you cannot see, right? Yes. And the fact yes. that you were able to just get away from what you were used to for 18 years and explore yeah. a different place, see different people, um, yeah. I think is amazing. And I think that's something that everyone should do. Um, because if not, you're 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 confined to where you are, and that's all you all you know. Um, and then the second thing is I remember um we talked about you having favor with one of the commanding officers. Yes. Uh, and one of the things you shared is that your mother um, had been praying that prayer for you, right? I think it was uh, um, in the, what was it? Luke 2.52, it says uh, that you'll grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And that's yes. exactly what happened, right? That you had tremendous favor with the with the lead commander. Um, tell us more about that. Absolutely. My mom has often said that. And even my brothers, my brothers would say I'm the Joseph of the family. So I, <laughs> uh, I don't want to say that I'm the Joseph of the family. Because, uh, <laughs> I don't want them to throw me in a ditch anywhere. Or anything. But uh, but uh, so. When I my mom has always told me, Sam, Samuel, because she calls me Sam. She mm-hmm. says, Samuel, you have favor with God and favor with man. So even when I was in the army, the CEO, the commanding officer of the unit, mm-hmm. an older white lady took uh, an interest in me. And so she had told me about going to school at night and uh, while I was in the army. So I started taking classes at night mm-hmm. and stuff. And then I also, uh, she, I then she let me be her driver. So she was probably about 60 something. I'm like 18 year old. Uh, at the uh, time. And uh, so then I would drive for her some as well. And then I would meet other different officers and they took a liking to me. Just the way I carried myself, I was really disciplined. I was uh, professional and I was, uh, I had good people skills. So mm-hmm. they took a liking to me, the commanding officer. So I, I was her driver. Then when I got to Korea, the uh, sergeants there and some of the other people 
really liked me, encouraged me to go to school. So while I was in the Army, I got my two-year degree, so I only had to do a little over two years when I got out. Mm. And I was able to do that by going to classes at night because a lot of people poured into me, saw what I was trying to do, Mm -hmm. and being positive and being a role model. And so they asked me. In fact, the Army wanted me. I was an enlisted, and they had said, Sam, we want you to go to officer school and become an officer. And I said, I will, I appreciate the offer, but I want to now go to college and uh, then go to law school. So yeah. I really found favor when I was in the Army, and it was nothing but God paid me. Yeah, yeah. Nothing but God. Yeah. God's hand on my life. I already know that. So you came back to the to the U.S. Uh, you came back to Illinois, right? Um, oh, to and, do, to, to do and I'll tell you, Cato, I came back to public housing. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I then I came full circle because I went to UIC. So UIC didn't have dorms at that time. Okay. So it was commuter school. Okay. So I'm now I'm at uh, UIC mm-hmm. getting my uh bachelor's in accounting degree, but I'm going home at night in public housing and mm-hmm. going to UIC during the day. So yeah. I go there, but I still know that I'm I'm not long for this place because mm-hmm. I'm getting my degrees and I know God has more for me than uh there. But I so yeah, I left my last year was in Korea, 1985. I got out of the army on my birthday, July 14th, 1985. Mm-hmm. So I was in 82 to 85. And so I got out and I started at uh, UIC that fall, the mm-hmm. fall of 85. Yeah. And tell us about the friend who was questioning um, your education path. Um, the one who didn't think you could be a lawyer. The one who was, you know, didn't think yeah. you were going to make it and share how you basically turn that around. Yeah, so I'm at UIC. I'm in Golden Key National Honor Society. I've had the chance to meet Mayor Harold Washington. I'm knocking it out the park. And so I volunteer to tutor students who are on academic probation. I And I volunteer to, and then the head of the program, Joyce Miller, mm-hmm. who uh, she pulled me aside and said, Sam, you are so good with students and everything. Have you considered law school? Mm. And so she planted that seed in me. Mm -hmm. And I took the test, did really well. I got in the U of I Mm -hmm. right away, and I got waitlisted at Michigan. And Michigan was the number three school in the country at the time. And, uh, And so I was telling some of my friends back home that I'm going to law school in the PJs. And so they say, Sam, how are you going to law school? They mm. first they said, lawyers don't come from here. Mm. I said, somebody's got to be the first. And they said, what makes you think it can be you? And then I turned it around, what makes you think it can't be me? Mm. And so that's a word for somebody yeah. uh, today, Paige. You. If somebody asks you what makes it think you can be you, we'll flip it around on them and ask them, what makes you think it can't be me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I used that as fuel when even when I got to law school, I was like, I can't go home. I can't flunk out. I can't. I'm not going back to Pookie, Ray Ray and Junebug and uh, <laughs> projects. So, so I used it as fuel. You use, use it as fuel, whatever it is. So, and that has motivated me. When I got tired of studying, I was studying more. I was like, Sam, mm-hmm. you can't go back. You can't go back. And so I used it as few. So when people say what you can do or what makes you think you can be the first, ask them what makes you think I can't be the first. Yeah. You know, and as I think about that, I feel like everyone needs that kind of friend. The the friend, the actually friend air quotes, right? The person who's gonna challenge you and you're gonna say, No, you know, right? Jeremiah 20, is it 29 11 that talks about oh, I know the plan that yes. I have to declare the Lord. Plans for good and not of evil. Exactly. And not harm you. Plans to give you a hope, hope and, a and in the future and an expected end. And that's yeah. I think that's the scripture that everyone should learn to stand on. Yes. Right? That no matter what, God has good plans for us. Yes. God has absolutely. For us to prop, prosper us and not to harm us, to give us yes. hope, to give us that future, that expected end. And that's what we can all stand on anytime we have 
our friend question yep. whether we're going to be the first or or not, right? Um, so I love that story because you obviously took it to greater lengths, right? You you didn't oh, just become a lawyer, a lot more than that. Um, and so yeah, that's a huge. And even then, in law school, so paid you on a uh, spring break. Everybody's mm-hmm. going to Cancun, uh, <laughs> Europe, and everything. I'm going back to the project <laughs> because again, we live there. I mean. <laughs> I'm at U of I. You have to go somewhere over spring break and everything. So I go, you go home. So I'm interacting with these guys mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm seeing them, but then I'm still going, I'm going back. So I've always interacted with them and I still kept it the same and I'm still their friends. I never thought I was better than anything. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. God had favor on me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and so we I still see some of them to this day and we're yeah. still friends. Yeah. I don't let I don't look down upon anyone. Mm-hmm. I just know God had a plan for me. Yeah. Hope in the future. Yeah. And you knew what the plan was, right? Because yeah. God has a plan for them. They just probably didn't know what it was. Yeah. I think that's probably the difference. All right. Okay, let's move us along. So you graduated and you landed a job at Winston. Um, at Winston and Sean, which is a law firm, um, for those people who don't know, and you, I think you started in 1991. Wow, how old was I? I can't even remember how old I was, but I was young at that time. <laughs> I'm assuming you were, you said I, I was young in 1991 <laughs> as well, and uh, so 33 uh-huh. years late, I'm still here, but yeah, I'll tell you about that. But I, I want to say something even then. I started in 1989 as a summer associate. Oh, okay. So, and then this is important. So even while I was working here at Winston and Strong, I uh, was still living at home in the project because I saved the, my money from the summer working at Winston to buy my mom her first car. Oh. So I paid my, I borrowed my mom her first car with uh, all the money I saved at Winston. And uh, so even I met this firm. With, uh, we're one of the largest firms in the world. We're the oldest law firm, one of the oldest law firms in uh, Illinois, founded in 1853. Governor Thompson was our head. And, uh, and it's a story. I met Governor Thompson. I was working at a White Castle down the street from the public housing development I grew up in. Mm-hmm. He would fly into Springfield from Springfield to Midway Airport, and his daughter loved White Castle, he said, and so he would get some White Castles Mm -hmm. there. And I took a picture with him one day with uh, Thompson uh, at White Castle, and my dad had some foreshadow enough to cut it out, and then when I started at Winston, he showed me the picture, and I showed the governor, and I actually have it in my office. I don't know if you can see that. Chicago no, I can't. Oh, I, wow. But uh, it's That's a amazing. picture of uh, Governor Thompson and me when I was a 16-year-old, and now we were law partners together uh, years wow. later, and he wow. always uh, remembered, remembered that, and we had a... He, really likes me as well. So I just really had favor with him as well. Yeah, that's amazing. And for those of you who don't know what White Castle is, it's a fast food chain because we do have folks who are listening across the pond. And I know before I, I landed in the US, I was like, White Castle, what's that? So I just wanted to, yes. to share yeah. with our listeners, White Castle is a hamburger chain or hamburger joint. It would be um, like a McDonald's or a Burger King. Yes, but yeah. definitely not exactly. as good. Definitely not as good as either. Anyway, that's just my opinion. You're right about that too. And I don't <laughs> need it anymore. But at the time, being one of 11 kids, I got most of my food from my castle. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I would tell you a funny story to tell you. So I'm in housing because I started working at 16 when I was sophomore year through a, a senior in high school. Uh-huh. And they said, Sam, the food is free but you just have to write it down. And so would I have all these siblings? So I would go to work and I eat everything because at home I'm not getting a lot of food. And so the boss calls me back. He said, Sam, we know the food was free, but look how much you're eating. So so then one of my friends said, you can still eat the same, just don't write it down. Right. But I said, no, I got to write it down still. I got to have some integrity. So yeah. I guess they left. But so they said the food was free, but they said I was eating up the profit. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a- that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Okay. 
So let's walk through let's walk through your journey to partnership because now yeah. obviously you've been a partner for a hot minute, um, said in a colloquial way, but for a while. Yeah. Um, what would you say um, you did differently to help you make partner? I think you made it in eight years. Yes, eight years, and uh, and I'll tell you the story there. So uh, I worked at Winston as my first year as a one L. Or that's my first year of law school. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of law school, then I came back full time in 1991. But then when I was a summer associate there, one of the top partners in the country and one of the biggest lawyers in the country, I met during the summer and he took a liking to me. His name is Dan Webb. And, uh, and Webb said, Sam, if you come back, I'll mentor you. So when I came back, I had. He put me on some of his big cases, and I and also another partner, Kimbo Anderson, put me on some of his big cases. Uh, and so I worked my way up through the ranks. I've done tremendous work, working long hours. Mm. And one thing, to be great, you got to be able to put in the work. And yeah. so I always had that work ethic. I would get in early and stay as late, sometimes had to do all night, but I've learned and two things I always tell my kids, you get two options when you have a task in front of you. Get it done or get it done. Choose option one or two, and I'm fine either way. So so I chose option one and two every time. And I it came to be known as a go-to because my law firm, at that time, there weren't a lot of African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially this is one of the largest firms. We have about a 1,000 lawyers in about 18 offices. Mm. So I made... Uh, partner in 1999 after eight years that's when at the time there was a two-tier partnership an income partner and then ownership, ownership partner and then 2004 i made ownership partner and paid you i became the first african-american in 171 year history of the firm mm -hmm. to go from a summer associate first year associate all the way through ownership partner. And that was nothing but, again, the hand of God yeah. and the favor I found. And, again, hard work. I've always learned, paid you, give God your best and trust he'll do the rest. Mm -hmm. But you got to do your part. Yeah. Every healing, every miracle in the Bible, God said, you do your part. Take up your mat and walk. Mm -hmm. uh, go wash in the pool of Salon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he uh, will... Uh, Peter come when he Peter walked on water. He had to get out the boat. Yeah. Every miracle you have to do your part. Mm -hmm. Trust that if you do your part, God will do the rest. Yep, for sure. Faith without works is dead. You gotta yeah, move. That's, that's gotta exactly. move. Gotta make those so, moves. Yeah, so that's a hundred seventy-one year history. So you got a kid from public housing who friends didn't think he asked him, "How do you think you can be a lawyer to go to be?" one of the uh, mm -hmm. partners at one of the largest firms in the world. And it has mm -hmm. changed my career trajectory. And then when I made partner, and I want to tell this as well, I started a foundation called the Give Back Foundation mm -hmm. with $10,000 of my own money, mm -hmm. where we gave college scholarships to inner city kids and everything. And I went back to my public housing development I grew up in and started a, a Boy Scout troop there because scouting was helped keep me off the streets and stuff. So I'm a big believer in giving back to whom much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And um, that that's actually going to be, that was going to be the next question. Because obviously in the, in the 33 years that you've been at Winston, you've probably made, you made some money, you know, definitely not living in the projects anymore, right? Yeah. It's not, not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> in Kansas anymore. Yeah. You probably, you're probably living in several other different houses that all belong to you. But I guess my question is, what would you say to um, Christian professionals who are in high income jobs? Because um, we have quite a lot of them listening, you know, folks who have either in law, we have people in investment banking, management consulting, making a lot of money. What would you say or how would you advise them in relation to making sure that they're spending the money in the right way? Yes, I'll, if I can sum it up, I would sum it up this way and then elaborate on it. As Christian professionals, we have been put on this earth to make a difference and not money. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to make money in the process, use it to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So, again, let me say that again. We were put on this earth to make 
a difference and not money. If you happen to make money in the process, use it to make a difference. So that's why I started my foundation. That's why I went back to my old neighborhood and started the Cub Scout Troop. I do. I volunteer to teach in Cabrini Green's housing projects, Henry Horner housing projects. I also go, Mayor Daly had appointed me a commissioner for public housing mm -hmm. uh, over the Chicago Housing Authority. I was appointed a commissioner. So I've used my money to help make a difference. Yeah. And, like, and as you said, I, I have done very well. I've created some generational wealth for mm -hmm. my family. Mm -hmm. But I, I know and I must give back and continue to give back. And I will, uh, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Mm -hmm. The sheep and the goat, Jesus yeah. asked was, I was hungry, will mm -hmm. you feed me? While I'm naked, will you clothe me? I'm mm -hmm. thirsty, will you give me something to drink? Mm -hmm. And he said, and as much as you do it for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, yeah, you do it for me. me. So yeah, so I, you have to give back. Giving yeah. back is a, a crucial part of success. Yeah. Uh, and let me say this, and I'll say this as well, Paige, you or somebody needs to hear this. If your world begins and ends with you, that's a very small world. Mm -hmm. If your world begins and ends with you, that's a very small world. There has to be a call bigger than you, yeah. and there has to be something greater than you. Mm -hmm. Help and give back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And God has, so, I mean, there's so many scriptures that talk about giving to the poor specifically, yeah, right? Yeah. That he who gives is power facing, but he who gives to the poor will not lack anything, right? Yeah. And just understanding that God's heart is towards the poor. God's heart is towards those who don't have. And we are basically the hands and feet of Jesus, right? And yeah, so yeah. he gives us, right? Mm -hmm. He gives us things. Um, so that we can, and I was on the receiving end a lot of that in mm -hmm. house. Uh, paid you. My dad had a third grade education, mm -hmm. my mom a 10th grade education, mm -hmm. dad from Alabama, mom from Mississippi. They met in Chicago as part of the great migration. Mm -hmm. And then when all of us went to uh, were grown, my mom went back and got her GED and uh, took a couple of classes in college, but at the time she had a 10th grade education and my dad a third grade. So education was their civil rights issue. Yeah. The best equalizer we have is education. Yeah. And, uh, so I fully took advantage of that. Education in God has just changed my whole trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. It's changed yeah. it tremendously. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. So we talked about your early childhood. We talked about your family. We talked about your mother and how instrumental she has been or, you know, in your life and shaping your life. We then also talk, talked about like you joining the army, your professional career yeah. you've done. God has used you to do so many things in the, in the legal firm. And then a couple of years ago, uh, not even a couple, a few years ago, God called you to ministry, right? Yeah. I yeah. would love, I would love to hear about this journey to ministry, right? So I think he said it was in 2006. Six. Yes, 2006. So I did a poll. I kicked against the pricks. Uh, I was, uh, I knew he was, God was calling me to something. And my mom was still kept emphasizing Samuel I, Samuel. I named you Samuel after Samuel in the Bible. God is calling you to ministry. God is calling you to mm. do something. Great. I said, Mom, I'm practicing law. I've got a wife. I've got two kids. Uh, I'm good. She said, just don't. And I, I did a Jonah. You, I went to Tarsus when he was saying, go to Nineveh. And uh, so mm -hmm. I Tarsus. And, and finally, nothing. I had to, you can't outrun your calling. I, yeah. I preached a sermon at my church. You can't outrun your calling. He just had a calling on my life that became mm -hmm. so significant. And so in 2006, I went into a uh, ministry mm -hmm. and I was in the, uh, the church I was in at the time. You had to have a uh, master's of divinity and MDiv. And so I was enrolled at University of Chicago. And I'll let you know, even favor there, University of Chicago doesn't have a part-time program. Mm -hmm. But they said, Sam, we were so impressed with you and your credentials and your life story. We'll let you go part-time and take classes wow. uh, at your pace. But 
will hold you to the same academic rigors. I said I wouldn't want to be held to any different standard. Yeah. So they let me finish at my pace. So I went on to get my Master's of Divinity from uh, University of Chicago in 2010. Amazing. And so once you got your your degree, uh, your master's, then you started or you joined a church. You went to go and pastor a church in uh, in a certain neighborhood in Chicago. You yeah, right. I went <laughs> to pastor in Inglewood. And for any of our <laughs> Chicago listeners, when you say the name Inglewood. Inglewood. Inglewood is, uh, for those listening across the pond, as Pedro said, Inglewood is probably one of the, it's considered one of the most uh, under-resourced communities, and there's a lot of things going there. And the bishop who sent me there at the time, he said, Sam, I know your story. You grew up in housing, and you're not scared to interact with the people. I need someone that will go there, and the people can look at it as a role model, and the people can see what they can become. So he sent me there, and I did four years there, and they were some of the four, the best four years and some mm. of the most rewarding years of my life as I interacted with people on the margins of society. I put on this earth to make a difference, not mm. money. And if we make money, use it to make a difference, Patriot. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, okay, so you spent four years in Inglewood. Um yes. I'm going to say that, for, again, as you said, uh, under, uh, under-resourced. Uh, uh, now, you can describe it differently. I, I want to say it's the hood. Okay. You, <laughs> I was you like, can. you are definitely a lawyer because yeah, you're like yeah. under-resourced. I'm like, it's the hood, okay? Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> um, it so you said the hood there. capital H. Right. It's and then you moved um, to Bronzeville, which is a, a nicer area um, in, the, in the south side of Chicago. Um, and now you you pass your own church, a uh, non-denominational church. You want to tell folks about that? Yes. So then I was in Inglewood for four years. And then the bishop of the church said, Pastor Sam, I want you to go to our flagship church in the city in Bronzeville. So then I was there from 2016 to 2022. So I was there six years. This mm-hmm. is a very, very well-known church. Uh, John Johnson of uh, Ebony and Jet Magazine got married at that church. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, this is a spectacular church. They had sent me there. And then, but, and again, that is a different church. And then while there, I just felt a big calling on my life from God to start my own church, a non-denominational church where Black, white, multicultural, multiracial, I, to start a church where heaven looked like people from all creeds, all denominations, yeah. everyone can worship the same God together. So I started a church, Hope Church Bronzeville is my church that I'm at now. I started in December of 2022. Now, a startup church is a lot of work. I was, I pick up the trash, I take out the garbage, I do it all there. I, mm. uh, the offering, I do it all, and I'm glad because. It keeps you humble. It yeah. keeps you humble. And, yeah. uh, and, it, and it keeps you humble. And, uh, and if Jesus can watch his disciples' feet, Me. I can pick up after the people and everything. Yeah. That, and uh, and it's a pleasure. My One of my favorite scriptures is Mark 10 and 45. Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve. So, and, uh, if yeah. we're honest, we'll put him to serve others. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. love that. I love that. As we close, Sam, this has been such a rich discussion and I personally have learned so much from you. Um, but as we close, I would like to ask, what is one key lesson, one key lesson that you would want to share with Christian professionals? It could be about anything, but one key thing. The one key thing. If your world begins and ends with you, that's a very small world. Mm. We're put on this Earth to serve, serve others. People can see better than they can hear. Don't tell people you're a Christian. Show them you're a Christian mm. by your love, by your walk, and by your actions. Will you be perfect? No, I'm not perfect. But at the end of the day, I know I've given God my best, and that He that has begun a good work in me will see it on to completion. Yeah. On my best days, I'm His child. On my worst day, I'm His child. 
-hmm. and he loves me either way. I strive to do my best, but on those days you fall down, get back up. Yeah. If you fall down, get back up again. Mm -hmm. The enemy doesn't win until you stay down. Mm -hmm. Keep getting back up. Yeah. We fall down, yeah. but we get up. Okay, that song just sing. came what to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to sing, sing that, that, you know what I'm saying? Cut off, but yeah. That's but, part yeah. of all the gifts yeah. you gave me, Paige. You mm -hmm. sing it is not one of them. <laughs> so I thought you were going to harmonize. I thought you were going to take the channel. She starts doing this when I sing in church, and uh, so she, so she's like, oh and that's my food. God loves all our voices, regardless of what it sounds like. But Sam, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time. I know everyone has learned, at least I have, and I know the listeners have learned so much from you. And I just look forward. I'm just grateful and celebrating God on your behalf because he has done so much for you. And I know he will continue to do so much for you as you turn the big 6-0. I know you said you're turning 60 soon. Yeah. Um, and God will just continue to, to do great work. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, and I hope to check in with you soon. You're very welcome, Paige. You and to your audience, thank you for having me. And I'm turning 60, but I still will say my latter years will be better than my former years with God. Yes, um, so I'm it right now that the best is yet to come. I'm looking yes. forward to the next step he has for me on this walk of faith. Yes. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Christians in Corporate podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I would love to hear your feedback. So please be sure to comment down below or connect with me on social media using the handle at Pejurakintarin. Oh, wait, and one more thing. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content just like this. See you in the next episode.